Hello and welcome to Deja Vu, the Ithacan's weekly review podcast. I'm reviews editor Jake Leary and I'm here today with Aiden Lentz and we're going to talk about our top three movies the first half of the year. And in case anything sounds weird, no, this is totally not the second time we're recording this because the memory <laughs> card got corrupted. No, why would you think that at all? Oh, you want to say hi, Aiden? Hello, everyone. All right. And in the spirit of last time, I think we're going to just jump right in. So what's your number three? My number three pick is Logan. What is your number three pick, Jake? Funny you say that. Also Logan. How wonderful. So Logan... (laughs) (laughs) We've become bitter in our young age. Um, Yes. Logan, the superhero movie that defied being a superhero movie. It will most likely go down as the best X-Men movie Fox actually bothered making given that the first three X-Men movies are very disposable and weird and leathery, and then <laughs> and then all of the follow-up movies, with the exception of two of them, are, I'd say, other than First Class, Days of Future Past, and Deadpool, which none of which are amazing, the X-Men movies just haven't been great. However, Logan really, it's not just a good superhero movie, it is a good artistic expression of James Mangold and Hugh Jackman, who both very clearly care a lot about Logan as a character, and it's really a beautiful send-off to a character that, despite almost exclusively appearing in not very good movies, we've all learned to care very, very much about, and it's the best you could ever hope, I'd say, that a superhero could be sent off. Hopefully one day in in 2030, we'll get a Logan-like Spider-Man movie where (laughs) he's just too geriatric to swing around anymore. (laughs) That's what I'm Um, hoping for. No, I'm definitely not hoping for that, but I echo the rest of that sentiment. Um, Yeah, really, I I never thought I would be able to say I felt an emotion while watching a superhero movie, but there I was, surrounded by friends, trying to put on, like, a stoic face. Um... (laughs) I, I had like a shocked face through half of that film because especially in the second half, it's just I was literally jumping out of my chair. Uh, it, it's so impactful and it's so it's so upsetting in, in the best way. It's a, it's a gorgeous film. All three performances um, from the lead actors, Hugh Jackman, Patrick Stewart uh, and Small Girl are fantastic. And even though the villain is somewhat weak um it's okay because uh, it it just allows you to really focus on the on the lead character is very similar to Guardians of the Galaxy and i would say even if the script didn't do him justice i liked what that guy did with the character um i thought i thought he similar to the lead uh villain in Deadpool injected enough charisma into the character that it's not it wasn't noticeably noticeably bad whereas i think ronan in the case of guardians of the galaxy didn't inject a lot of charisma to the character so the writing issues were very on display and very clear yes hopefully not something that will be uh, repeated with the sequel but that'll that'll be on a future episode of deja vu i'm sure let's go on to my number two and your number one yes we're bouncing around a little bit but that's just the fun of it uh my number two is get out my Your number, number one, one is is get out. is get out. Yes, um, which I did. I predicted that coming into this, um, yeah. but rightfully so because like uh, Logan, you know, really surprised me in how it was a really well executed superhero movie. Get Out surprised me in that it was a really well done horror movie that came out in 2017. Yeah, the trailers when they came out, I think really had a hard time blending the genres of comedy, horror, and thriller in a way that didn't come off as somewhat bizarre. Um, But when you watch the film, it's shocking because Jordan Peele, a first-time director, manages to confidently blend horror, thriller, and comedy into one cohesive movie that also is full of of very specific imagery um, and a central thesis on race in America that I think really gets overshadowed. Um, The things that he says about race aren't just your typical like, oh, racism's bad. It's more, he he gets into some more like insidious and jealous aspects uh, of, of racism that are really fascinating and not 
very well explored in other films. The easy way um, to portray racism is, yes, this, it's the general giant specter of racism, but it doesn't actually, ad- like, a lot of times films won't actually address the nuances and the, like, really, really sinister complexities of racism, and Get Out is all about those sinister complexities, and I think that's what makes it, A, terrifying, um, yes. and B, so effective. And often... The movies that do bother to, like, 12 Years a Slave and other films like that, they can portray racism in a real, in a very real and nuanced way, but it's in, like, the 18, it's, like, in 1800, so there's still a degree of separation going, mm, those are the bad white people, whereas this film, I think, really, I'd say turns a mirror to every white person watching that movie, and really kind of shining a light on the very bizarre aspects of our culture where we treat black people like they're the villain, but also then take their culture and almost fetishize it, um, which is, again, very relevant as it's still, as I'd say, as different aspects of black culture become more popular than ever and racism is also as prominent as ever, really this movie couldn't be more timely. Yes, and I think that's the best ribbon you could tie onto the perfect uh, perfect present that is Get Out. Um, so we're going to go back in time a little bit. Um, what's your number two? My number two is Patterson. It is a wonderfully meditative and soothing movie by Jim Jarmusch, um, the best silly name in the biz. And it is a film starring Adam Driver as a driver in the city of Patterson named Patterson. There's a lot of clear name stuff happening in this movie. And it follows a week in his life, uh, and it is a very simple movie. Uh, you go through every day, um, and is, every day is the, exactly the same. This is a character that takes comfort in the routine of his life. In a lot of movies, we see these characters uh, that are stuck in a rut, and the point of the movie is that they get out of their routine, like in American Beauty, um, etc., And the point of this movie is that for some people, routine is beautiful and wonderful and and they can live a fulfilling life under it. And I think that's a really kind of wonderful perspective that's not often shared in film. Uh, I think the cinematography in this movie is quite nuanced and interesting. It took this really special approach where many, many, many of the shots are repeated every single day of the film um, to really show that routine in Adam Driver's or Patterson's life. But every day there are these small little interactions with people he's never talked to, he's never met, these little conversations he picks up on, and these shots that are of the same building, of the same waterfall, of the same whatever. However, it's just from a slightly different angle, and your perspective on it really kind of changes. And it's a beautiful encapsulation of the very same experience that that you can get out of life, I'd say very frequently, where you're walking to wherever you're going and it's very routine. But you just looked at a tree a different way than you had the day prior, and it's just really kind of nice. And, yeah, I think if you're having a very stressful day, Patterson's reassuring, and it's calming, and it's it's really kind of wonderful. There's something to be said for that. I can't attest to the movie itself, but often we go and we see a big-budget action movie, and it's like rah-rah crazy energy all the time. Or we go into, you know, go to see the super RC movie and it's Manchester by the Sea and you walk out of it like you've just been, you know, kicked in the head. It really is something special about a movie that can comfort you and leave you feeling good, um, even if it isn't like, you know, the ride off into the sunset ending. And I don't know if it is, but if there's just like a general atmosphere of positivity, that's really something special. Yeah, I think a lot of, uh, I'm a fan of Woody Allen and people have their own problems with him, but I think that's one thing that many of his films really kind of manage is is this general just comforting positivity, especially like Midnight in Paris. I quite like that movie. I agree with you and I could go on for hours about that, but I won't because uh, our producer would kill me. Um, But that's actually a really nice segue into my number one pick which is Your Name, a Japanese movie that came over, uh, I I think it was released in Japan last year, but it came to the States this year a couple weeks ago. It is a suburban magical realism movie that's a coming-of-age story, which is like the most perfect combination of words you could say to me ever. And it has that kind of comfort food effect to me. 
um, that it seems like Patterson did for you, where there's this visual beauty and there's this narrative beauty and there's a really subtle and complex like romance that's in there in the background. And it surprised me too. And that's not something I expected. I expected to like this movie because people have been talking about it like it's the second coming of Christ. And I... I'm always wary when I hear people say that, but but it's really, really good. And it's really, really enjoyable to watch. It's really satisfying to watch. You know, you feel like a part of you is invested in that story. And in case I didn't mention it, it's pretty as can be. And it, that will stick with me for a while, and that will have a space on my shelf the second I can. I have not seen this film, but when you said the words magical realism and coming of age, my face lit up very, very brightly because... I'm a fan of movies like The Breakfast Club and shows like Atlanta, where out of nowhere, it's it, it, something ridiculous and unbelievable happens, but it works very beautifully. So I can't wait to watch this movie, despite my limited interactions with anime. I, I basically no experience with anime outside of the uh, the very cliche um, big names in the anime field, the you know Hayao Miyazaki's and a few of the other Funimation movies but oh yeah Hayao Miyazaki's everyone yeah loves his films because they're they're all wonderful yes wonderful delightful charming comfort food um and there really is something to be said for that that's going to do it for us for this week Aiden people want to reach out to you how can they do that uh alents1 at ithaca.edu check out some of my reviews on the Ithacan website yes they're probably okay that's a way more cynical attitude than you should have. No, if you want to read the Get Out review, the Lego Batman review, the Patterson review, the Your Name review, I'm sure I'm leaving something out. If you want to check any of those reviews, links will be in the description below this video. Uh, come back every week. We're really trying to have as many reviews out there as possible. If there's anything you want to review, you want us to review, any topics you want us to cover on the show, you can send an email to ithacanlifeandculture at gmail.com. Very soon, we're going to have our own email. I believe now, if you check, actually, these podcasts are up on SoundCloud. So that's a cool thing that you should do. Um, And hopefully iTunes soon. Fingers crossed. Please, please, please. Um, But I'll let you know when that happens. This is actually the final episode for the season. And it's been so great to do this and so great to start this. And I can't wait to do this next semester, too, and get into all sorts of crazy shenanigans where hopefully I don't rant incessantly about random movies that I really, really love. For Deja Vu, I'm Jake Leary. Thank you for listening. Have a great summer. Mm